Advertising surrounds us everywhere and is now much a part of our daily lives as the air we breathe. But most of us think it has no real effect on us at all, that we're too smart to be taken in by it, that we can just ignore it, click past it, or block it from working on our minds. Though no matter how much we think we can outsmart it, there's no getting around the fact that advertising is the dominant storytelling force of our time. Over the past 100 plus years, more thought, more effort, more creativity, more time, more attention to detail, and more overall money has gone into advertising than any other campaign in human history to mold consciousness. The result has been a non-stop flow of ever more sophisticated, visually stunning, and powerful commercial appeals, expertly crafted stories that tap into our deepest fantasies and desires, and speak to the very core of our emotional lives, telling us over and over again that happiness and satisfaction are linked to consumerism and the consumption of things. So the real questions we have to ask are about the larger cultural impact of the stories of advertising about how these stories have come to shape our sense of ourselves, our values as a society, and how the consumer mindset that advertising celebrates is feeding an endlessly accelerating cycle of consumption that's literally pushing the planet to the brink of collapse. My name is Saj Ali, and for the last 30 years, I've been looking at how advertising as a storytelling system shapes the perceptions, values, and priorities of those of us who live in consumer capitalist societies. And one of the most striking things I've come to realize is that very few of us actually stop to think about how it works and what it's really doing to us as a society. The visionary author Marshall McLuhan once remarked that media images and messages have become so pervasive a part of our cultural environment that they often disappear from view. It's like the fish in the water. We don't know who discovered water, but we know it wasn't a fish. A pervasive medium, a pervasive environment is always beyond perception. And this is clearly the case with advertising. Like the proverbial fish in the water, we're so immersed in advertising that we hardly even notice it anymore. And along the way, I've lost sight of just how completely and methodically corporations have taken over the culture. Over the years, advertising has come to literally colonize the culture, taking up more and more physical space, creeping into virtually every nook and cranny of the visual and audio landscape, driving out other possible ways of thinking and being as it competes for our attention nonstop. It's an imperialist project from which there's no escape. Even if we were to somehow give up our smartphones and other screens, advertising and corporate brands would be impossible to avoid confronting us at every turn as we make our way through the spaces and places of daily life. And the sheer amount of time, talent and money that businesses have expended to accomplish this has been nothing short of astonishing. Corporations now spend more than $200 billion a year on advertising in the US alone, a figure that's greater than the total GDP of many countries. Globally, the total amount spent on advertising is $570 billion a year. And these are not just like other media messages. They're carefully and meticulously crafted by the best creative talent that society provides. For instance, TV ads now cost much more to produce than the programming that surrounds them. So, 60 minutes of television programming now costs an average of about $4 million to produce, about $33,000 for every 30 seconds. In comparison, producing a 30 second network ad costs about $352,000, 10 times as much, translating to a cost of $42 million to make 60 minutes of ad content. And that's just the average. When you realize that more and more 30-second spots now cost over a million dollars to produce on their own, it starts to become clear just how much time and attention goes into putting ads together. We walked into this beautiful room so old, like all marble arches, and there's rose petals all over the floor. We shoot for five days, all for 30 seconds. 
no detail is left for chance. In fact, if you wanted to compare advertising to anything, it would be the biggest blockbuster Hollywood films like the Transformers franchise. And actually, a number of the biggest directors in Hollywood are now actually making ads in between making movies. For example, Michael Bay, the director of the Transformers films, has shot many commercials, including Victoria's Secret, Budweiser, and Nike. Even Martin Scorsese, the legendary Hollywood director of movies like Taxi Driver and Goodfellows, has made ads for Chanel and Dolce & Gabbana, starring A-list Hollywood actors. Dolce & Gabbana, the one. The amount involved in producing some ads are just mind-numbing. Uh, Buzz Lerman, the director of the Oscar-winning film Moulin Rouge, made a short three-minute film for Chanel No. 5 that starred Nicole Kidman and cost a staggering $42 million for a commercial. But actually, the amount spent on producing ads are dwarfed by the billions of dollars corporations spend on making sure they get seen. The main way they've done that is by taking over the media and essentially turning them into a delivery system for their ads. Just look at where the money comes from to support various media. Broadcast television and radio rely on advertising revenue for pretty much 100% of their income. So their main function, the actual purpose of TV shows, is to get our attention so we can be sold to advertisers. Similarly, newspapers get roughly 80% of their total revenues from advertising, and as their content moves online, that figure is growing. The magazines rely on paid advertising for roughly half of their income. That's one of the biggest reasons why, over the years, commercial media outlets have been allotting more and more time and space for advertising and allowing actual programming and editorial content to shrink. For example, on television, in 1952, ads accounted for about 13% of the time. Today, that figure has doubled, so that advertising now makes up about a quarter of what is on television, and much more on some channels. But advertising isn't just crowding out content. More and more, it's actually making its way into content, thanks to the trend of product placement. Sometimes this is done by having the product featured in the scene. Other times, it's by having the product become part of the dialogue. Trying to be smarter, brother. Trying perfectly healthy. Not the way I make it. But this subway sandwich, sweet onion chicken teriyaki with jalapeno and banana peppers. Bam! And sometimes the stars of the show actually pitch the product itself, talking about what makes it so great. How about Nick Litter? Goofish. What was that? What's well, going uh, on? Adaptive cruise control. When the Prius senses the car ahead is too close, it warns you and slows down. Oh, right. so the car is smarter than our victim. The product placement is probably most prevalent in Hollywood films, where movie producers routinely accept money in exchange for featuring brand names within the films themselves. In the James Bond franchise, for example, the website for the 2015 film Spectre lists a dozen or so brands that appear in the film, what they call business partners, a collection of branded products that are then often featured in scenes. And at times, they've been written into the actual dialogue of Bond films. Relax. Amiga. Beautiful. On a parallel track to the product placement phenomenon, more and more movies themselves have become vehicles for selling billions of dollars worth of merchandise. Take the Star Wars franchise. And, you know, it's worth remembering that box office receipts are only one part of the Star Wars money-making machine. Experts predict that the sale of themed toys could bring in another $3 billion. While the films have sold a lot of movie tickets, the box office income is dwarfed by the amount of merchandise sales. Things like toys based on the characters and gadgets and movies. Or spin. You can discover authentic adventure with the Star Wars Micro Machines collection. Figures, vehicles, and playsets, each sold separately. In addition to the merchandise, there are also the billions of dollars that come from the licensing deals to put the Star Wars brand on anything from Lego sets to mac and cheese. So think about the films not only as cultural texts, but just as really long ads for all the stuff that can be sold to the Star Wars brand emblazoned on them. And that's the general logic of Hollywood films now, selling stuff, not just tickets. And this commercial colonization of popular culture 
extends to other areas as well. Look at professional sports, which are now totally integrated into the machinery of marketing. Corporate logos and product pictures are everywhere in ballparks, in stadiums, in arenas, positioned expertly for every camera angle so that they're impossible to miss during a television broadcast. And increasingly, athletes themselves have become human billboards, fully branded and emblazoned with corporate logos. Even institutions that were once thought to be outside of the market are now fully enmeshed in the world of advertising. Call it the new map in education funding. Cash-strapped districts, like this one outside Orlando, have resorted to selling advertising in schools. Banners here support a couple of restaurant chains, a sportswear maker, and a local yogurt shop. <laughs> and at game time, the announcements are no longer just for raffles and bake sales. You need a complete sports drink. Power 8, ion 4. Seven states now allow ads on school buses. And this high school in Minnesota is putting them right on student lockers. The district even created a new position, Director of Sales. Not content with occupying all available space on Earth, at one point in the 1990s, advertisers came up with the idea of colonizing space itself, proposing to launch a rocket 200 miles into orbit and unleash a giant billboard inflated with gas. The Mylar billboard would measure about two-thirds of a mile across and a quarter mile tall. From Earth, it might appear about half the size of the moon, the company originally said, and envisioned charging 20 to $30 million to whatever corporation might care to buy space. But since then, as our gaze has shifted downwards into our smartphones and tablets, corporations have turned their attention from outer space to cyberspace, whatever it takes to get their brands in front of as many eyeballs as possible. Since the early 1990s, when commercial interests took control, the Internet has become one of the primary delivery vehicles for corporate advertising. In fact, you could say it's the greatest mechanism for marketing commodities ever invented. There's never been anything like it to deliver eyeballs to corporations for their products. Some commentators have remarked that Google and Facebook are not communications companies at all. Now, after all, they produce no content. They're actually the biggest advertising agencies in the world, selling our consciousness to corporations. And they've only just started. Because so many non-media devices, for example, cars, heating systems, buildings, coffee makers, washing machines, headphones, lamps, are connected to the internet. People have been talking about a non-media network, an internet of things. It's been estimated that there'll soon be 26 billion connected devices. And companies like Google and Facebook are looking to use this network to put ads on literally everything and to ensure that there's an ad in front of us our entire waking lives. Will the ads? They're coming. Google to the Security and Exchange Commission says it plans to put its ads on everything from your car dashboard to your wristwatch to your refrigerator. What? You think we're joking? We're not. These companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon, they all want to basically control the Internet of Things so we can deliver advertising uh, it, it, to any device. The overall effect of this commercial takeover of the culture, not surprisingly, is that we are drowning in a flood or an ocean of commercial messages. There's just no escape from it. Simply put, in terms of sheer size and scale alone, there's never been a mass information campaign to match advertising in the history of the world. So the question we need to address now is, what effect has it had on the culture and society? When industrial capitalism came into its own in the late 19th and early 20th century, the effects were nothing short of revolution. Never before had the world seen the sheer quantity of commodities that industrial factories were now producing. In fact, one of the first economists to try to make sense of capitalism, Karl Marx, observed that what distinguished capitalism from all previous economic and social systems was its ability to produce what he called an immense accumulation of commodities. But for capitalism to survive and grow as a system, production alone would not be enough. At its core, Capitalism depends on commodities going through a three-part circuit of production, distribution, and consumption. Production has been solved by labor and cost-saving advances in industrial technology, by easy access to raw materials and energy sources, and by hiring cheap, low-wage workers who didn't yet have any labor rights. And distribution has been solved by new modes of transportation that enable factories.